funding for Indian Pride is provided by the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe, National City, the Otto Bremer Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public. On this episode of Indian Pride, we will explore the topic of Indian advocacy, hear a story about why a duck waddles, and enjoy traditional performances from the East Coast to the West Coast. I'm Junie K. Randall, and welcome to Indian Pride. American Indians have a long and distinguished history of leadership and advocacy. Indian Pride presents a look at modern-day advocates for the Indian people. Hearing an elder at, a, at one of their college conferences, and he says, we're warriors, and he says, you need to think about how we are warriors in today's society, and he said, use your words like bullets. You have to get an education in order for our traditions to stay alive in today's society. It inspired me to stay in school. It gave me the experience to testify before Congress, to testify before the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, to make sure that when I represented my tribe that I knew our history, what we were doing and what we were fighting for. It kind of hit me and it's a, it kind of woke me up and it kind of made me think, you know, this isn't just for me, it's for all of us. And she was in her 60s. This conference that we're, we're at here this week is to honor that commitment from the 1971 White House Conference on Aging and to advocate for the future. There was a promise from the government at that time that we're going to try to serve the most vulnerable people in, in their communities. And if the commitment that they made to the tribes could have been followed at that time, we wouldn't have to be asking for the things that we're asking for today. Also, if those services could have been provided today, some of those elders would be still with us. For this conference, thousands of elders came to us to give input on what their recommendations were for this president and this Congress to enact. So when we, the delegates, got to Washington, D.C., they had a, a format set on, on how we were going to proceed to the conference and address the resolutions. I realize it's almost like a tunnel that it's going to be difficult to get to the end. But my goal is to see that the Indian elders get the services that they're entitled to. I think it's important for the Mohegan tribe to represent themselves and I think it's important for any Indian tribe to represent themselves because only we can tell our stories. It's important to tell our stories from our perspective so we've always spoken for ourselves. In the 1900s when we were trying to fight against our burial ground being made into a Masonic temple, it was our tribal leaders who went to the state and actually met with the governor to protest the fact that our burial ground was being dug up, our bones were being burned, our bones were being thrown into the river. Unfortunately, they were unable to do it, and the reason they were unable to do it was because they couldn't afford the $25 to pay the attorney that we needed to fight the cause. So again, if you look at even in the span of this century how far we've come, it's sad. When you think of all of the losses, every tribe has those stories. I've seen a lot of cohesion within the Indian communities, and I think as people have found their voice, I think things have changed. And what you find is that when you have a collective voice, you have more of a voice. I always thought we should have a place in this country where we celebrate the leadership of American Indians over time, the George Washingtons and Thomas Jeffersons of, of Native Americans. There have been some remarkable Indian chieftains. The legacy they left behind were really quite remarkable leaders, and I think we should have a place in this country to celebrate Indian leadership and celebrate uh, those who have been great leaders on, of the Indian nations over the history of this country. Of paramount importance to American Indians is the need to provide advocacy in support of issues affecting Indian people. 
The oldest and most effective advocacy organization within Indian Country is the National Congress of American Indians. Joining us today is the president of this organization, Mr. Joe Garcia, the governor of the Oque Owinge, formerly the San Juan Pueblo of New Mexico. Welcome to Indian Pride, President Garcia. Thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here and it's an honor to be here. Well, it's our honor. Let's get started and give us a little history lesson about the National Congress of American Indians, which is one of the best organizations in America. Okay, what prompted the National Congress of American Indians was uh, partly the Dawes Act back in 1887 and then the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934 and a lot of efforts for changing the um, policies and guidelines and all of that for Indian Country and Indian Country didn't feel very comfortable. So in 1944, a uh, group of uh, Indian uh, people, well-educated Indian people, uh, decided that maybe they need to start a uh, consortium and the end result of it was after a couple of years of planning was the National Congress of American Indians with the first conference being held in Denver uh, 1944 and thus uh, NCAI, the National Congress of American Indians, was established with its um, functions to protect the sovereignty of Indian country. Uh, when you go back and you look at those records, Joe, as the new president, and you look at the goals of the newly established NCAI organization, how humbling are they, and what were their what was their mission back then? Well, the the mission basically is still the same: to to be the advocate group for changing policy, for protecting sovereignty, for uh, providing any and all efforts that Indian country needs. Uh, so that it becomes a safe uh, environment for all of Indian country and those mission and that mission is still the same uh, but NCAI has not always been a smooth organization because in, in fact in the first year 1945 it began to lose some of its uh, uh, what would you call momentum in, in at the onset it, it was a great organization I mean just starting off but uh, politics and other things, other factors, as you know, will, may harm an organization. And so NCI has seen its ups and downs since that time. And uh, it's, a, it's a stronger organization than it ever was uh, from that point on. Uh, back, b back then when they started, of course, you know, a lot of Indian people that lived on reservations didn't have electricity, they didn't have running water, they were very isolated. It must have been very difficult for them to communicate uh, their mission and, and try to get all the messages around Indian country so that they can be an advocate. So uh, what kind of organization did they establish in terms of trying to be inclusive of all the Indian tribes? Did they? I, I know they have like a, a 12 region set yeah. up? In fact, the, uh, the uh, model that was used was the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs model for uh, the different regions or areas, used to be called areas, that the uh, BIA uh, had established and that, that sort of takes into consideration, for instance, the Southwest, Northwest, and the, the extra uh, nine uh, regions. And um, in fact, the people that um, organized the, and established the uh, NCAI were actually bureau people and so there was a flavor of bureau and from Indian country it was almost the sense that well this is an uh, organization established to help the bureau and that didn't fit too well in a lot of Indian country because uh, they felt that that, that wasn't the, the proper form and so um, there were a number of issues. Uh, one issue was is this organization for uh, urban Indians or mm -hmm. those Indians that are well educated? Uh, is this a group for, uh, is this organization for tribal uh, organizations or tribal uh, council people, tribal administrators, or what is it for? And so it, it, there was a, a whole lot of discussions about what is the intent of NCAI, but I think it finally became evident that uh, it was not for councilmen, it was not for one group or another, it's not for one region, okay. and thus came the, the model uh, became a useful tool. Mm -hmm. And so we, we still have that um, uh, organization, that model as of today. President, would you like to share with us some of the early accomplishments of NCAI? Okay, a uh, couple of things. One was the um, uh, termination area 
er era of the United States, and uh, that prompted again the the organization to move forward and say, you know, we cannot have termination. We've got to fight that with all means and right. all causes, and so that kind of drove the efforts for uh, the advocacy and for the uh, support of the organization in itself. But it also uh, another big factor is human rights. And I think that uh, civil rights, if you will, in this case, and civil rights was a major, major prompting uh, cause or uh, impetus for moving and continually moving forward with NCAI because we also saw that uh, a lot of Indian people were, were forgotten and they were, you know, kind of uh, being assimilated into, into the dominant society and uh, we, we sensed or there was a sense of loss of culture, loss of language, loss of tradition. And uh, that being the underlying principle upon which sovereignty is based, uh, it's important to uh, continue protecting that. And so uh, those two um, incidents or two occasions and two uh, mindsets, if you will, was the driving force for continuing NCAI into to building it uh, stronger than it, it was when it first started. So they've accomplished a lot of goals since 1944. I, I you know, I'm sure that they have uh, have a lot of uh, <coughs> history in terms of Self Determination Act, and then moving forward. Um, I know that uh, you, as a new president, you you are trying to establish some new goals, and can you share those with us? Uh, yes, and in, in fact, the, uh, one of the first things that needs to happen when, whenever a, a person comes into an organization is to, if, if you've not been involved, to at least know what the organization has done, its structure, its mission, its uh, right. uh, weaknesses, its, its strengths, and, and although NCAI had a lot of strengths, there were some areas that, that I think needed some refocusing. And part of that is their a lot of Indian organizations throughout this country, national Indian organizations, and I'll, I'll, I'll name a couple, the National Indian Education Association, the National Indian Court Judges Association, the National Indian Health Board, the National Indian Housing Authorities, and the list goes on. The National Indian Council of the Aging. That's right. And so, you know, if, if they're out doing and being advocates for Indian country, then there's a common ground that we right. all follow. And I think that commonality is we're all doing it for the uh, survival of Indian country. And if we use that as sort of the engage ourselves and bring that strength, mm -hmm. then we have a united cause. And I think that's really what, it, what we're doing now is that we're building the collaborative efforts with all the Indian organizations throughout the country and creating partnerships, not just with the Indian organizations, but uh, with other agencies like the state agencies, uh, federal agencies, and um, I mean, it's just superb, and I, I feel that strength just gaining, gaining day by day. President, would you like to share some of your goals that you've established as the new president of NCAI? Well, economic development is um, a term that is probably is a result of prerequisites that have to be in place, and those prerequisites are uh, education, uh, infrastructure, and then uh, plans on what kind of economic development does uh, an entity, in this case tribe, want to pursue. And so as a result of, of uh, something that is kind of controversial in some cases, not controversial to me, and it's not controversial to Indian country, and that's called Indian gaming. And so Indian gaming is sort of the driving force for allowing Indian country to move forward with the uh, economic development. Well, your passionate efforts in Indian advocacy are making an impact not only in Indian country, but across the nation. Thank you for joining us on Indian Pride and informing us about the history of National Congress of American Indians. Thank you so much for having me. They always start out, they say, okay, ikitome lo chis amani naha. Uh, the ole mani. Iktomi again is searching for a free meal. And so he's walking and he hears a familiar sound that he hasn't heard for all winter because it's a time of starvation. And he's so hungry, but then he hears these waterfowl must have returned. They're making a big racket. So then he sneaks up there, he looks over and he sees a whole pond full of them. So he tries to think of how can he fool them. He gets so he has got a little sack, he stuffs that with grass and he starts walking in front of them, just ignoring them, but those 
ducks, you know, they stop. They don't know it's you. Tell them, hey, where are you going? Oh, I've got a big bundle of songs here. He says, I'm, I'm in big demand. These songs are so, so beautiful that you, once you hear them, you just can't help but just dance. All these ducks and waterfowl, they're so excited. They want to hear it. And they say, oh, we don't do anything just to hear your music. He said, okay, I guess I can. I need a break, he said. But then there's a clearing there, and he says, well, just at sundown, everybody gather there, and I'll uh, I'll bring some of these songs out. And they say, okay, okay. So then he runs out, and he starts cutting all his wood, you know, getting because he's going to fix up a big meal for himself. He's planning ahead. He's going to roast some of them underground and some on top. But anyway, uh, the appointed hour comes, and, and all those waterfowl, ducks, and everybody, they're all gathered there. And so he told me, he says, he has got special instructions. And you have to follow the rules. You can't violate the rules. And if you forget the rules, it's in the words, he says. In the words of the song, it says, Ishtogamus wa chipo. Ishtogamus means, means the eyes shut. Wa chipo, dance with your eyes closed. Then he says, says Ea troa hantash. See, etwa means to peek. Ea troa means hantash. If you peek, if you peek. Ea troa hantash. Ishta means, ishta means, ishta ni shashak. That your eyes will become red, see. Uh, if you peek, your eyes will become sore. They say, okay, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. So, so then he starts out, he starts singing. And he's, you know, he's singing and the ducks are dancing on But see, when they come close and he bops and makes a big pile, this one duck is kind of getting a little bit suspicious. First he hears all his friends shuffling feet, but then he sounds like now, so he just can't stand. He's got a peek, so he peeks. His friends, they're all gone. He sees a big pile. They're all laying there. And he, so he realizes they're being tricked. That's Iktomi. So then he calls out. He says, Waktapo! Waktapo! Le Iktomi! Eh, lonaha! He says, uh, he says, oh, you guys, look out. This is Iktomi. He's killing all of you. He says, run, run, run for your life. He says, take off. So they all take off, you know. Anyway, that Iktomi, he, he, uh, he chases that little one down. And he says, he grabs hold of it. He says, oh, how dare you ruin all my plans, spoil my plans. He says, you'll pay for this. And then he kicks that poor little duck up and, when it goes up really high, he comes down. He hits the hits that water, you know, really hard. And and the uh, that little duck is what they call a diver. He's got little red little eyes like that, really sore. And he told me he kicked him so hard that his poor little uh, uh, his legs are are such that he just can't can't walk very fast. He just waddles real slow. But he he's always at the bottom of the pond. See. Our cultural performers today come from two tribes, one from the east and one from the west. The beautiful voice of Viola Brooks graces our program by singing in her native language. Viola is a very proud member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe of California. Our second performer, Eric Maynard, comes from the land of the rising sun with the sounds of the drum and song. Eric is an enrolled member of the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut. In our songs and in our ceremonies, we use what nature provided us, which are things like this hazel stick. And this is a, this stick keeps rhythm uh, to accompany our songs. Also, we have our necklaces. Each necklace helps us sing and has its own song. And uh, so that, so the necklaces and the rhythm, these sticks help us sing our songs and our ceremony. Eno, 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 oh, 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 Eno.
Hanno and oh hey ya, 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 Oh and oh hey ya. songs were originally uh, from the Delaware people um, who brought them up to the north uh, and these songs were given back to me by some Iroquois people. My favorite dance, uh, my favorite song is the duck dance. The uh, duck dance is a traditional dance about hunting and it involves um, men who of course are the hunters and ladies who are the ducks. Generally the men um, will make quacking noises um, during the song. sing traditional songs of the East using uh, my water drum. Most of the songs that I sing have dances that accompany them. Now, usually there's uh, someone who plays the rattle. I mean, it sounds more nice. There's, it takes more than one to sing these songs. I'm all about the social dancing and the social part of it. I don't have you no know, ceremony duties or anything like that. And I don't really want to.
I'd like to thank all of our special guests for sharing their gifts and talents. We invite you to join us next time as we present another great showcase of Indian pride. Whenever you get a chance, do something kind for a child. Bye-bye for now. Funding for Indian Pride is provided by the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Forest County Potawatomi Tribe, National City, the Otto Bremer Foundation, and the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>